feet and worship the Lord. Lift up your voice and praise Him. Hallelujah. 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 Come here, Lori. Let's sing this.
Come on, singers. Well, well, well. I said, well, well, well. <laughs> now, we always have to sing something on Sunday morning to kind of get religion off of us. It kind of creeps in like a fog, doesn't it? This is a, a 1999 version of Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, if that's all right. Rage. 
Let the earth shake. Let the hills and the mountains fall into the sea. Our God still reigns. Everybody sing. Trumpet inside. 
Arise, arise, O Lord. Arise, my beloved. Arise. Arise, O Lord. Hear the call of your people, Lord. Hear the cry of your bride, Lord. Arise, O Lord. Arise, O Lord. and burn for you, O oh Bridegroom. Our hunger and passion burn for you, O oh Bridegroom. We sing this a lot in revival, but I feel like we should sing it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. Brownsville, he has sent you to the nations to proclaim the gospel of the truth, to be a beacon to the hopeless, to show the glory of the Lord. This is the year, this is the year. Of the glory of the Lord. This is the day of the power of His might. This is the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the day. Your city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Reflectors of his glory as the evil rises, the glory of the Lord will break through and break every hindrance. This is the year, this is the year. Do not be faint of heart, don't be faint of heart, and don't lose your vision. This is the year. This is
is an awesome God. He reigns wisdom.
Lift him up. Lift him up. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Ore mama andresere ova ma bayanda la 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 bayanda la 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 la. Alleluia. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord Jesus. In the other building across the street, just worship the Lord. Here in this building, just worship the Lord. Wonderful Jesus, we look to you today, Lord. Give us the leadership of your spirit, Jesus. Give us the leadership of your spirit, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have other stuff planned in the service. And uh, Brenda, I want to ask you if you will to do that at the end of the service, if you will. I need to move right into my message today. It's just the time to do it. This is the moment to do it. If I put it off any longer, I'm going to lose the momentum of what the Lord is saying. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And uh, I want everybody that has your Bibles, I'm going to give you a moment to get back to where you're seated. And I want everybody to stand. In, in honor and in deference to the Word of God. I don't think we ought to ever be sitting down whenever we share a text from the Word, from God's Holy Word. How many of you today, let me see your hand, how many of you today brought your Bible with you? Can I see your hands, please? Hold them up high. All right, good. You're going to need them. 
because today I've got a different kind of a message altogether. You don't know how long I wrestle with the Lord over this thing. I mean, I wrestle with the Lord over this thing, and I don't. I would have rather went in my my repertoire of sermons down through the years and pulled out anything to preach rather than this. This is tough. It, uh, it's prophetic because I'm going to be going to prophetic books of the Bible. But it's also prophetic because I feel that the Lord has spoken to my heart and I don't claim to be a prophet. I'm a pastor. But I, I want to come to you with the right spirit whenever I reveal the message that the Lord has given to me. I want to have the right spirit totally. I look at things completely different than I once looked at things. Even as society as a whole, I look at it different than I used to look at it because I realize how desperately our society and the societies of the world need God. God's judgment is not, to me, it's not a terrible thing. To me, it's a wonderful thing because God's judgment usually is administered to bring forth mercy. And uh, today, this message is really difficult for me to preach because I, I would like to come to you this morning and feed you from the Word of God. I have a whole pile of scriptures. I don't have the four pages of notes, but I have a whole bunch of scriptures. And I won't even call this a sermon today. I just want to call it an exhortation as to how God is dealing with my heart. Now, I know that people are going to be watching this message from all over the world because we're on the Angel Satellite Network and we're also on other networks. And this program is carried all over Great Britain. It's carried really all over the world. So I know today that as people hear this message, they're going to tune in at certain points in this message, different people from different places. Very few people catch the whole message and they'll tune in at different points. And I want to make sure that whenever people tune in that they hear the mercy and the love of God and not a harshness and not a meanness of spirit. But the message that I have today is a very solemn message, and um, it deals with, are we seeing the wrath of God? That's the message, that's the title of the message, are we seeing the wrath of God? Isaiah chapter number 26 and verse 9. This is a powerful scripture. I mean a powerful scripture. Isaiah the prophet, verse 9, With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Did you feel that? Let's read that one more time. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. Whew. Jesus of Nazareth. Ooh, I feel the presence of the Lord. Jesus. One more time, verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, as I just told you, this is one of those messages where I don't relish coming to the pulpit with something to say of this nature. I don't call myself a judgment preacher, but I do call myself a preacher that preaches and loves to preach on the coming of the Lord. And I believe with all my heart that we are very near to the coming of the Son of Man. I thank God for what he has done 
in this church. I thank God for what he is continuing to do in this church. I thank God that he has brought people from around the world on this piece of real estate. We thank God that he's touched people and continues to touch people. But yet at the same time, while God is doing a great work here among his body and among his church, I feel also that the Lord wants us to expand our vision. I know that God is speaking to me about expanding my vision. And God is dealing with my heart with a burning passion as I've never had before to go after the lost and to make a mark and to make my life count what days I have left on the earth to make my life count to help the nation that I love so much, America. And of course, we all love the nations of the world. But I have a tremendous burden for America. And the scripture that I just read to you is a, is a solemn scripture because in verse 9 it says, <clears throat> When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. It talks about earth and world there, the inhabitants of the world. I've been watching real closely what's happening in the world as everybody else has, and this, things are happening so quickly now. You know, a person would have to be blind as a bat not to understand what God is doing in the world. You have to be blind to see that God is not doing something. <clears throat> now, I know <clears throat> that hell is busy also. I know that the devil is, um, he has his ways and he has his means to carry out his dastardly deeds. But recently, and this is the part that I didn't want to say, this is the part that my soul draws back from saying. Recently, we've seen some things where our hearts have been stirred. We've seen earthquake in Turkey. Of course, we've seen earthquakes all of our lives. But we saw a, a, a terrible earthquake hit Turkey and just completely devastate that nation. We saw thousands of lives lost. We saw people homeless. We saw them in the streets by the multiplied hundreds of thousands, people afraid to go back in their homes. And then a tremor would come and people would run frantically and anxiously back out in the streets with horror all over their faces. And then we see other things that's happening. And I won't go into a, a litany of those things, but we see other things that are happening. Boy, here's what the Lord said to me. And I want you to let this sink in your spirit today because this was a strong word that he gave to me. God said, when my judgments come in the earth, he spoke to me and he said, don't you be one that lends your voice that says that it's not God. He said, pulpits are busy around the world saying that it's not God that's in some of these things. But the Lord spoke to me and he said, don't you add your voice in saying that it's not me because God said in so many of these cases, it is my judgment in the earth and I'm bringing judgment to the inhabitants so that the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. God says his judgments are in the earth right now and they're going to increase greatly in a short period of time. And I want you to hear me closely and I say this with a humble heart. God said they're in the earth right now but they are going to increase greatly. And the Lord has warned me not to dismiss this thing and water it down. And when certain things happen, people will be coming to us and they'll be saying what do you think about this and the Lord says don't dismiss it as not being of me the Lord says without saying that it's definitely of me you talk about what I say in my word and this is a scripture that he gave me he says that the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness when his judgments are in the earth yesterday I heard two things just signs of the times. You don't have to listen hard, but they come. I heard two things yesterday 
where my ears perked up and it was another shout of the friend of the bridegroom that said, prepare ye for the bridegroom cometh real soon. And here's two things that I heard yesterday. It may sound stupid to you, but it's true. And this is one of the reasons why the Lord says my judgment is about to break forth speedily. Yesterday on CNN, I heard that Disney, Walt Disney World, is not going to, that they're doing expos, the different nations are doing expos, and they're going to hold it at a certain location. And nations of the world are putting millions of dollars into these expos. And they said that Walt Disney World was not going to show Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And they caused a controversy over it. And they said Israel has already put millions of dollars into this expo. But now Disney World refuses to declare Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Which leads us all to understand that increasingly, increasingly, hear me, increasingly in the days and weeks and months to come, you are going to see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears that Jerusalem is going to become increasingly controversial. Go with me to Jeremiah. I didn't intend to go to this portion, but just go with me real quickly to Jeremiah. I'm sorry, Zechariah. Zechariah. Chapter number 12, <clears throat> Jeremiah, uh, Zechariah chapter number 12, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. God said in verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, and when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. God said, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. I am not going to get into politics this morning, but I just want to say from a scriptural standpoint, what you are going to see start increasing, and you are going to see attached to this burdensome stone, the city of Jerusalem, you're going to begin to see the judgments of God in increments break out as it has to do with Israel, or with Jerusalem, because look at it one more time. God said, I will make Jerusalem, in verse 3, a burdensome stone for all people. God said, in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the United Nations Though all the people of the earth, which will be the United Nations, be gathered together against it. You cannot gather all the peoples of the world on the real estate around Jerusalem. That's impossible. But from the place where the nations of the world meet in New York, the United Nations, there will come a day that the United Nations will burden themselves with the subject of Jerusalem and they will make wrong decisions and that decision will cause very drastic judgment of God to break out in different parts of the earth and it will all be traced back to the welfare and the status of Jerusalem as to how it relates to the Jews. You're going to see it. And the Lord says to me, 
He said, son, don't you add your voice and water down and say that I'm not in it. God says, because if you do, I'll move my glory and I'll go somewhere else where I can find a man that will speak up for me. And I want to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, I am willing to speak up no matter what the consequences are. I'm willing to speak up. I don't feel like I'm anybody. Honestly, I don't. I don't feel like I'm anybody. But God has done something powerful, and he has given us a platform. And because of that platform, I want to walk humbly before the Lord, and I want to speak justly and rightly. I don't want to say too much, and I don't want to say too little. But the one thing that the Lord has said to me was, don't add your voice to those that say, when my judgment is in the earth, that, that judgment is not of God, that it's Mother Nature, or that it's a happenstance. God said, if you add your voice to that, I will lift my glory and I'll move on. He said, be bold to stand up to the critics and the agnostics and the naysayers. Be bold to stand up and say, God is in this somehow. And I want to say to you today, God is right now moving mightily in the face of the earth. Wake up and see that our God is doing some great things. And you haven't seen the last. You really are just beginning to see the beginning. Our televisions now are almost constantly bombarded with news events that are hot off the press, and by the time they get that story, another one is breaking somewhere else. One of the things that alarmed me this week that I saw that I didn't like, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I did, when those kids were shot in that church in Fort Worth, it didn't get near the coverage that Columbine got. Didn't get near the coverage. And uh, they didn't get near the coverage that any of the school shootings got. And it didn't get near the coverage that the man that killed all those people in Atlanta, the day trader, it didn't get near the coverage that he got. As a matter of fact, the hurricane was more important than a church being invaded by a man that martyred a bunch of Christians in the house of God. I think that it would have been a lot better if we would have recognized the blood that was splattered all over the walls of a church in Fort Worth than talking about the floods that took place up and down the East Coast. That's just me. But I wonder what's happening to the conscience of our nation. I wonder, are we becoming so acclimated to shootings now that we're not going to give coverage to them? Or are we getting to the point that a school shooting is more important to this secular society than a church shooting is. I don't understand why we didn't have the coverage. And I'd like to get some feedback from some of the networks. And I'd like to get some feed feedback from some of our television audience. If you watched television this week and you didn't see that that got the kind of coverage that other shootings did, I'd like to hear from you and find out what your opinion about it was. Something's up. Matter of fact, well, I won't say that. <clears throat> one crisis, one catastrophic event after another, one gripping drama, shootings, storms, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, flood, fires, almost constantly. And God said, don't dismiss this, that he had nothing to do with it. I'm not saying that God, I want to make this clear, I'm not saying that God put that man up to going in that church and shooting those kids. I believe the devil put, the, put that guy up to that. I really do. I'm not saying God did that. But I'm saying that we are seeing now society breaking down that people don't have a problem entering into a church on a Wednesday night. What you don't know is that's the area, Fort Worth is the area where the first meet you at the pole took place in America. That's the place where the first one took place, in Fort Worth, Texas. And those kids had just left 
uh, uh, see you at the pole rally and had come back to that church for a time of celebration and great victory. While they were in that church celebrating, I'll meet you at the pole rally, see you at the pole rally. That's when that guy came in there with a cigarette in his mouth, loaded gun, loaded clips, started cursing those kids and shooting them. I just wish, now it's just me talking, but I just wish that the major networks would have put on some major correspondence and they would have stayed on the air hour after hour talking about such a dastardly evil thing that's taking place in our church, in, in church in Texas. I just wish they would have done that. And we see these things taking place. And it makes you wonder what's going to happen next week. What's going to happen in the next few days to come. Now, there are going to be people that's going to claim that certain things that's happening is an act of nature. Now, I'm not, I'm not a fool, friend. I understand that there are certain times of the year, like right now in September, when the Weather Channel, other meteorologists can tell you that there is a hot period in the tropics where hurricanes form, tropical storms, tropical depressions form. It's a hot period. It's really from about August, uh, just about the whole month of September, winding down in the first weeks of October. It's a hot time because as the earth is rotating on its axis, as the winds begin to whip around, those Cape Verdes begin to form off the coast of Africa and some major hurricanes have the opportunity to hit this nation as well as other nations. I know that speaking as far as the climate is concerned, I know there's a hot period. But I also go to the Word of God and I find out that God has His hand in the elements also. The Lord yesterday began to take me into the Word of God and He began to show me some things that I want to point out to you. As a matter of fact, go to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is about seven or eight books to the left from the last of the Old Testament. It's about seven or eight books to the left of the last book of your Old Testament. Jonah chapter 1. I want you to keep your Bibles handy this morning because we're going to be going to a lot of scriptures. A lot of them. Look in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4. The Bible says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Would you say that with me? But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Who did it? The Lord. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Now look at verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the scene be calm to you, for I know that it's for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it has pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Let me tell you what happened here in a nutshell. The Bible says in verse 4, the Lord sent a great wind into the sea. Why? Because of rebellion of one of his servants. One man was not doing what God wanted him to do, and God sent a great wind into the sea and caused the sea to become tempestuous. And the Bible says, Jonah said, if you'll take me up and cast me forth into the sea, he said it will cease. They threw him into the waters, and the waters and the wind ceased. 
And the Bible said in verse 16, look at this, the Bible said, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Look this way, everybody. What did the scripture that I read to you a while ago in Jeremiah say? When the judgments of the Lord are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And the Bible says in verse 16, look down at it one more time there. It said that these men feared and then they offered sacrifices. They feared and then they offered a sacrifice. That judgment that God brought because of a man in rebellion against him, that judgment caused those mariners on that ship to fear exceedingly so that when it was over, they brought God a sacrifice. When the earthquake hit recently in Turkey, I heard some conversations of people there. And here's what the conversations went like as the broadcasters broadcast it back to America. You saw the people speaking in their native language, their native Turk language. And as they were speaking, there was a woman there that said, God did this because we have become so, so terribly wicked. That's what she was saying in Turkey. Allah has done this because we become so vile and so godless and so wicked. And then another one spoke up that they interviewed and said, had nothing to do with this. God had nothing to do with this. This is just the plates of the earth jumping over one another and it caused the tremor and it caused the great devastation. Then they interviewed somebody else and there was all kinds of attitudes and beliefs about what happened in Turkey. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, what do you think? I don't know. But I do know when things like that happen that the conscience of man becomes very tender and they become very thoughtful about higher powers. And I'm not talking about new age higher powers. I'm talking about God Almighty. And I'm talking about the fulfillment of God's word, his prophetic word. The conscience of that nation became tender and all of a sudden people's everyday life was interrupted. They, they were interrupted in, in their normal things, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and working and going to school. And just as they went back to school this last week, on the first day of the kids going back to school in Turkey, they had another tremor that measured 5.9 on the Richter scale. And everybody ran back out into the streets with horror all over their faces. And many people they interviewed said, we're not going back in our homes. It's just too nerve-wracking. The Bible says, when the judgments of the Lord are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. I want to show you something. Are you all still with me? Watch this. I've heard people, go, go to Psalms real quick, Psalms chapter 24. I've heard people say, I'll give you time to turn there and then I'll tell you what a belief is. I've heard people say that God right now doesn't have anything to do with anything in the earth. I've heard, really heard people say that. And did you, would you believe that that's pretty well commonly believed in a lot of circles of Christianity? You see, they, they'll say that whenever Adam, or whenever Adam and Eve sinned, that the devil came and gained their authority. And when Jesus came to the earth, the devil took him up on the pinnacle and said, I'll give you all this if you'll just bow down and worship me. They said, there's a lot of people believe that whenever the devil took Jesus up and showed him all these things and offered him the earth and the kingdoms of the world. They say that, Adam, uh, that the devil had the right to do that because Adam and Eve gave it over to him in the Garden of Eden, that he, the devil, has authority. Well, I want to tell you, the Bible calls the devil the God of this world. 
But if you look up that word, it doesn't mean the God of the earth. It means the God over the cosmos, the God over the world system. The devil is the God over this world system. But in Psalms 24, it's interesting what the psalmist said here, chapter 24, verse 1, it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world, you see that? The world and they that dwell therein. Go to Luke, what Jesus said about it. Go to Luke chapter 10 and verse 21. Luke 10 and verse 21. How many of you believe that Jesus would say something that wasn't right? Oh, come on. I said, how many of you believe that Jesus would say something that wasn't true? Look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 21. It says, in that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. The Bible says that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's. God is sovereign over the elements of the earth and can use them to facilitate his wrath if he pleases. Now, I want you to look in Genesis 6, and I want to show you, this is after the sins of Adam and Eve. I want to take you back here, and I want to show you something powerful in regard to the flood. I know I've got a lot of scriptures this morning. This is highly unusual, but I wanted you to see every one of them. I could have picked a hundred more, but I wanted you to see these at least. Genesis 6. I want you to look this way when you find it. Everybody look this way for a moment. Friend, if the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, God can choose to use the elements of the earth to facilitate bringing wrath on the earth. I said God can use the elements to facilitate bringing his wrath on the earth. God will bring wrath so that the inhabitants of the world will greatly fear and learn righteousness. Now, in the flood, this is interesting because I wanted you to see this. Sometimes we read over things and we miss it. In the flood, the Bible says in chapter 6 and verse 17, God said, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Why? To destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Verse 17, God said, I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. There are people in pulpits today. Listen, this, listen everybody, look this way. There are pulpits and preachers today that will not preach that because they say they don't want their congregations to become fearful. My God, it's time to become fearful. It's time to become fearful. It's time to wake up. And it's time to become sober and realize that God can bring his wrath if he chooses, any time he chooses, and any way he chooses. And there are preachers that won't preach that because they say it will make children afraid. Well, I want to tell you something. My mama used to bust my rear end with a belt and a switch when I was a boy. And they say that if you do that today, it'll warp your personality. It won't warp your personality, but it sure do wonders for your rear end. My mama wasn't but four foot 11. She was four foot 11. I was bigger than her since I was eight years old. Even when I was 17, I was six foot one when I was 17 years old. But if my mama told me to be home by 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, and I wasn't, and I did something she told me not to do at 17, I had a holy fear of that little four foot 11 woman with a peach tree switch in her hand. I had a holy fear of her. 
And to this day, I'm 50 years old almost. And to this day, when I think of my mother, I think of love, compassion, mercy, but I also remember that switch and that bell. And I know today, even when I would even think about doing anything that I shouldn't do, I could hear my mama say, boy, I'll tear you up. <laughs> Amen? I'll tear you up. I remember one time I came in from school and I'd done something wrong and she said, go out there and cut me a peach tree limb off the peach tree. And I went out there and, and I had on short pants. And I come back in and I cut the measliest little frail peach tree limb you've ever seen. Little old bitty thing like this, you know. And I come in and I had on short pants and, and mama said, boy, that ain't no switch, that's a straw. Get back out there and cut me a peach tree limb. And I went back out there and I cut me a nice one, thinking if I brought in a big old bad one, she'd have mercy. I brought in one, it was no mercy, friend. I brought in one and I said, Mama, I know you're gonna whip me. Can I go change britches? Can I go put on some long britches? She said, she sort of snickered and laughed. She said, I guess so. And I went back and put me on a pair of blue jeans, but I still felt every lick of that switch. I mean, she tore me up. Four foot 11. Here she is like this, and here I am like this. But I had a holy fear of my mother. You know what's wrong today in the church? We haven't preached the whole counsel of God. We haven't preached the whole counsel of God. In an hour that we're living in, I want you to hear me, everybody. I don't want to max mean here. But in an hour that we're living in, right on the brink of the coming of the Son of God, right on the brink of the breaking forth of tribulation on the earth, right in a time when hell is breaking loose, one of those most popular messages of the hour is money cometh. When are we going to learn that money is not the answer to our problems? Listen, we are under a president that under his administration, we have enjoyed the lowest interest rates, lowest inflation, the best incomes, lowest unemployment in America. People are doing better than they have ever done. And we got more hell than you shake a stick at. And the church has the audacity in this hour to be somehow motioning in the spirit world for money to come to me. Friend, let me tell you, money is not the answer to the ills of the world. I tell you what God is trying to do. God is trying to show us that money doesn't satisfy, things don't satisfy. God's trying to show us, I love you and I want to bless you and I am blessing you. But if I have to pull the rug out from under you to get your attention, I will pull the rug out from under you. And friend, I hope that doesn't happen, but I am here today to warn you. And I believe that God has raised us up and given us a little bit of a voice. And I'm here today to say that the time for money cometh is not now. God said, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he said, all these things shall be added unto you. But I think it is so sick that right now in this particular time frame that the church is stuck on this thing of money cometh, money cometh. I've seen preachers just so excited, money cometh, and they're closing their eyes on television and calling it in. I'd much rather see them close their eyes on television and say, Jesus is coming. Our money's coming. Jesus is coming. Amen. Well, the Bible says in verse 17, God said, I bring a flood of waters upon the earth. But look in chapter 8, verse 1. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Look back at chapter 6. Flip back over there real quick. 
Verse 17, God said, I bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Now look at 8 and 1. God made a wind to pass over the earth and caused the waters to assuage. Verse 2, the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of 150 days the waters were abated and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. They became visible. Now look this way, everybody. This is after the fall in the Garden of Eden. This is after Adam and Eve gave over their authority to the devil. The Bible says in chapter 6, God said, I bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Well, if the, if the earth is the devil's, I didn't think God had any leverage here. I want to tell you, friend, God owns the earth. God owns the earth. And it said he brought the flood waters. And then in chapter 8 it said he remembered Noah. And God made a wind to pass over the earth. And the waters started assuaging. Now, I want to show you something. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. I heard another thing on the news yesterday that I wanted to tell you about. It was CNN. And it's two birds over in Israel. Did anybody hear about that? Two birds over in Israel. Two homosexual birds. Two male birds in Israel. And they don't even realize it, but it's a fulfillment of prophecy. What they were talking about. They were talking about how the Israel is working with vultures. And whenever a vulture hen lays an egg, they'll take that egg away so that she can't incubate that egg. They'll take the egg away and give it to another vulture to sit on it so that that hen will lay another egg. They're trying to rapidly increase the vulture population in Israel which is a fulfillment of Ezekiel. It's a fulfillment of Ezekiel. But here's what the Jews, here's what the, they interviewed some of the Jewish people over there at the zoo. They call it the biblical zoo. Of all things, they call it the biblical zoo in Israel. And they said that we have a homosexual pair of birds that is sitting nicely on the egg, hatched the egg, and is raising the little young vulture and they're doing wonderful at it. They said they're doing so good at it, they probably do as good or better than most of the other heterosexual couples of birds. They said they're doing so good, we're going to even give it more uh, eggs to warm and to hatch and to take care of. Now you think about that. It said they mate, said that vultures mate, homosexual pair of mates, and they're taking care of the little vulture baby better than a lot of the male-female pairs of birds. And that was on the national news yesterday here in America, and they were laughing about it. And they were just gloating that that homosexual lifestyle, even with the birds, works so well. If it works so well with the birds, why can't America wake up and start recognizing one-sex marriages, same-sex marriages? And they're totally qualified to raise children also. Well, I want to go ahead today and make this real clear. Let me go ahead today and make this real clear. When I was in Canada, they told me, they said, now, Brother Kilpatrick, <clears throat> when you come to Canada, don't say anything about homosexuality because if you do, they will fine our church $300,000, and on the third offense, if we do it, they will actually put us in jail. That's what they told us. So I don't know. I don't know about the fine. I don't know about the jail, but that's what I was told. But even if there was a fine this morning of $300,000, and even if in America there was a law that said you preachers can't say this, I want to tell you I'll just have to go to jail because I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. 
And here's what I'm going to say. God is against homosexuality. It is unnatural. Listen, it is unnatural. It is ungodly. God is not against homosexuals. He loves them. But he's against homosexuality, same-sex sex. He's against it. He's also against adultery. You heterosexuals out there that thinks I'm going to let you off the hook. He's also against adultery. And he's also against fornication. He's against fornication, sex before marriage. He's against all sex outside the marriage bed. I want to show you an interesting scripture. Turn to Romans. Hold your finger right there because I'm coming back to it. I told y'all I didn't want to do this. Go to Romans chapter 1. Y'all with me? It sure is good. Because I'd hate to be up here by myself. But I would. And I mean that I would. Well, I want to show you something here. This is powerful scripture. Now, I didn't, didn't come this morning with this in my notes. But let's, let's let it be real clear. Don't amen and don't clap or nothing. But let, let me just make a statement. We're not trying to work up a crowd here, friends. We're not trying to get some kind of emotional frenzy going on where people amen the preacher because he's really bearing down on sin. But I'm telling you that same-sex marriage same-sex sex to lesbians, homosexuals, gays, gay men will bring the wrath of God. It will open you up to a curse. It will open up a trap door in your life and a curse will come upon you. Witchcraft, dabbling in witchcraft, you can't imagine the trap door that it will open up and curses will follow you and will plague you and God will stalk your steps with darkness. I didn't say the devil would do it. I said God would do it. I've got Bible to prove it. This is not the scripture here, but I've got Bible to prove it where God said he will stalk the steps of the ungodly with darkness. And it's time that we stop fluffing this off and saying that, it, well, it's just one of those things. It's time that in America we stop acting like homosexuality is, is fine. I can see even the church is becoming conditioned to the fact that, you know, homosexuals is all right. Our president may stand up for it. Our president and the Congress may pass legislation saying it's okay. But God never said it was okay. God never said it. And I'm here to tell you as a man of God, preaching the word of God, that if you don't stop it and turn to God and let God help you, it will bring damnation and the wrath of God on your head. I want to show you something about this scripture in Romans. I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but if you get time sometime this week to read the whole chapter, the first chapter of Romans, it would really be powerful. But look, look at this. In verse 23, it says, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible. You cannot corrupt God. It changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up. Friend, look this way. I would hate like everything for God to give me up. I would hate for God to give up my boy. I'd hate for God to give up this church. I'd hate for God to give me up as a preacher. Give me up and give me over. He don't just give you up. He gives you over to a reprobate mind. Gives you over to a spirit of uncleanness. Gives you over to a spirit of perversion. He don't just give you up. He gives you over. You better watch out how you dabble in things that you know is ungodly and evil and perverted and sick. It says, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Look this way, everybody. I pray, Lord, help us in the ministry, myself included, 
to never feel the peer pressure and give in to peer pressure where we change the uncorruptible glory of God into something that's corruptible and where we take the truth of God and turn it into a lie. Because what the pulpit preaches, the people by and large believe. Like priests, like people. And I pray that God helps us to be true and to stay firm and to stay godly and holy so that we preach the truth in love that people can say, I believe it just like it's written in the Bible. Look at this. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. They changed the truth of God, verse 25, into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. See, God gave them over. See that? God gave them up, and then God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Look this way, everybody. God does not just give up. He won't leave things up in the air. He will give it up. That means he released you from normalcy. He released you from blessings. He released you from holy grippings. He released you from... from uh, his blessings and his nest of goodness put you up for grabs, let you loose, cut the ties around you, and then he took you while you was in midair and then gave you over to the devil. Gave him over, the Bible said, to a reprobate mind. What is a reprobate mind? The Bible says to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now look at verse 32. This is where I'm trying to get to. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are what? Worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. When I heard that report yesterday on CNN about those birds, this scripture came back to my mind. Verse 32 came back to my mind when it says that they which do such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. These reprobate, secular, ungodly, corruptible minds that's been given over to a reprobate mind, they took pleasure in airing that report about those homosexual birds in Israel, raising an egg, hatching the egg, raising a little vulture, they took pleasure that that homosexual couple was able to provide the nurture and the care of that little vulture. They took pleasure in that. And here's what the Bible said in that same verse. It says they are worthy of death. That's God's estimation. That's not my estimation. I didn't write that book. You didn't write that book. But see, we have drifted so far from God. The things that we hear every day in our everyday lives, the news broadcasts, the newspapers that we read, we have drifted so far from God that to read something like that today in 1999 in your Bible looks almost like, oh, how unmerciful could God be? No, friend, God never changes. And you better make sure you anchor yourself to him. The world may change. The ideologies and the philosophies and the belief systems of the world may change. But you better anchor and bolt yourself down to the word of God and keep believing what God says and forget about these other things. Wow. Let me hurry. Y'all still with me? Look at Genesis 19. We'll go back there. I'm hurry. I've only got one more page to go.
Genesis 19. <clears throat> Look at this. Now, I just told you about those birds, and I just told you about homosexuality. Look this way, everybody, for a minute. How many of you believe that homosexuality is a sin? It's a sin. How many of you believe that God sometime won't wait till people get to heaven to judge, that sometime he'll bring judgment while they still live? And I want to tell you something about God. The, the thing about it is that can fool you. I want to tell you something about the mercy and the long-suffering of God that can fool you. You think, because God shows long-suffering and mercy, that it's just going to drag out and drag out and drag out and drag out and drag out. But I want to tell you, there will come a time he'll stand up and he'll say, enough. This is it. Oh, but God, no, but God, nothing. That's it. Look what happened in Genesis 19. I want you to see this. I want everybody to see this. I didn't want to just preach it and tell you about it. I want you to see it. Look at 19, verse 24. Then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Twice, it says it in verse 24, twice. Look at it. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire. And then secondly, it says again, from the Lord out of heaven. It says twice, it came from the Lord. Now, let's talk about famine for a moment. Go to Genesis 41. I'm going to talk about several things here before I close. I'm going to talk about earthquakes, wind, thunderstorms. I want to just show it to you for a minute. I want you to look in your scriptures. Believe me, friend, I could give you hundreds. I'm just choosing a few. These are little snapshots, but I could give you hundreds. I want you to see this. Genesis 41, verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he shows to Pharaoh. He said, Behold, there will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and then there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it should be very grievous. And for the, that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. It says God will shortly bring it to pass. Not the devil. But God will shortly bring it to pass. Famine. Genesis chapter 10. I'm trying to stay as close in the same book as I can without having to run all over the place. These are just snapshots that I've chosen, but I want to show you some powerful stuff. I want to show you three scriptures about the wind. I tell you what, let me, let me skip these. I'm not going to have time to go through these. I've got too much other stuff to do. Let, let me skip these on the wind. Believe me, I got them. But let me give them to you later. Let's go to 1 Samuel. Let me go to the thunderstorm. <clears throat> My time is running out. 1 Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> I want to show you one on the thunderstorm. By the way, You probably expected this to come, so let me just go ahead and say it. <clears throat> what I'm about to say, I'm not going to say as a prophet because I'm not a prophet. I'm a preacher. I'm just a, just a pastor. That's all I am. So I'm not saying it as a prophet. <clears throat> but many of you probably expected it to come, so I'm going to go ahead and say it because the Lord told me that he wanted me to say it this morning. You don't really have any idea, friends, <clears throat> of the things that are going to break out on the earth in the near future, you think you have a point of reference from things that's happened in the past? 
things that are about to break out on the earth, there's not even a point of reference for them of anything that's happened in the past. They're going to be strange. They're going to be unusual. And the Bible says it like this. It says there will be fearful sights from heaven. Not fearful sights in heaven, but fearful sights from heaven. The Bible says in Matthew 24, if you take time to read it, it says in Matthew 24, Jesus said there will be earthquakes in diverse places. But when you go to Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21 says, there shall be great earthquakes in diverse places. Seismologists will tell you that a great, great earthquake is usually anything over 6.5 to 7.1. That's great earthquakes. You don't even hear most earthquakes reported anymore because now there's so many of them that now on the Weather Channel and things like that, they'll just show you a little yellow dot or a little light blue dot where they had an earthquake in Alaska, they had them all up and down California and Oregon and Washington State. They don't even report them like they used two years ago because now anything really under like a five or six is not even really reported that much. But Jesus said in Luke 21, he said there will be great earthquakes in diverse places. And believe me, there's nothing that gets the attention of the inhabitants of the world like an earthquake. Such helplessness, such feelings of helplessness, and such a sensitivity upward and outward, people begin to think about God. They begin to think about their evil ways. Just like that woman in Turkey said, as a Muslim, she said, we have offended Allah because of our evil ways. Look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 16, and I'm going to go to earthquakes in just a second. 1 Samuel 12, verse 16. Now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Verse 17. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain. And you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. Now look this way, everybody, just for a minute. This is, when, this is when Samuel was rejected by Israel. They didn't want a prophet anymore. They didn't want God. They wanted to be secular, and they wanted to be, uh, they wanted to aspire to be like the other nations. They wanted to have the accolades and the praise of other nations. They didn't want to be a holy nation anymore. They didn't want a prophet leading them. They wanted a king like other nations. So Samuel now called into the Lord in verse 18, and the Bible said the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto our sins this evil in asking for a king. And Samuel said unto the people, Okay, fear not, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside, for then should you go after vain things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are vain. The Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it's pleased the Lord to make you his people. Now the Bible says here very plainly, it says, The Lord sent thunder and rain that day, verse 18, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. It was a thunderstorm God sent to get their attention because he was displeased that they were trying to depart from him. Oh my, when I think about how America is daily, daily departing from the Lord, it makes me wonder and it makes me quiver and shake as I wonder, God, what are you going to send to bring this people back to yourself? Now, somebody might say, well, Brother Kilpatrick, does God cause earthquakes? Well, let's take a look and let the Bible talk about it. Go to Psalms 18. Psalms 18. I'm closing. This is my last page. Psalms 18. Verse 
Verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I'll be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death come past me and the floods of the ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell come past me about and the snares of death prevented me in my distress to call upon the Lord and cry unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Look at verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The fountains also of the hills moved and were shaken because the Lord was wroth. The Lord was angry. Isaiah chapter 2. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures. I want you to see it. We're going to let the Lord tell us what he thinks about earthquakes. Isaiah 2. Look at verse. This is the last day. This is a prophetic verse concerning the last day. Verse 19. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. When he arises to shake terribly the earth. Now look this way. I've just given you two scriptures and I'm going to give you a bunch more, but I want to ask you this question. How dare me or any other preacher stand up when the earth shakes and say that God's not in it? How dare us to do that? I heard the Lord say to me yesterday, boldly and emphatically, he said, do not add your voice to those that says, I'm not in this. He said, don't you do it. Isaiah 24. Verse 18. Twenty-four, eighteen. It shall come to pass that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the fountains of the earth do shake. Verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Now, I want you to look at that one more time. I'm going to read verses 18, 19, and 20 this time. This is prophetic. This is the last day. Listen to it. It shall come to pass that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall in the pit. He that comes up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows of heaven, for the windows from on high are open, and the fountains of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Now let me take you over to Luke real quick and I want to show you that scripture so you can underline it. Luke 21. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time in the book of Revelation. Luke 21 and verse 11. You'll see there verse 11 where it says, And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. Look at this. Great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences. And it says, Fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven, not in heaven, but fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven, from heaven. Now, I want you to go with me. I don't know if you've ever paid much attention to this or not, but I want to show you something real quick in Exodus. Hold your finger in Exodus 19, and then go to Matthew 27. I want to show you something powerful, and I want to show you how God moves sometime, and we just take it for granted. Hold your finger in Exodus 19, and then go over to Matthew 27. Matthew 
Exodus 19. You know, any time God ever did anything really powerful, really powerful, and you think about this, any time God ever did anything powerful, he always shook the earth sort of like a, a sign to back it up. Did you know when God gave the law to Moses that he sent an earthquake? Look at it. Exodus. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, it says, And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. God sent an earthquake and quaked the mountain, shook it greatly. Look this way, everybody. It was like he gave the Ten Commandments, but he didn't want to just give the Ten Commandments. He gave pyrotechnics to back it up. Don't you love that about God? Wouldn't you have loved to have been there that day with Moses? I don't know if I would have or not. You know, the Bible says that the people ran off and said, You speak with him, Moses. Tell him not to talk to us no more. Amen. Why? Because of the awesome, fierce presence of God. And God is sending his awesome, fearsome presence again on the earth. And I want to tell you again, I feel the Lord saying to me in my spirit right now while I'm talking. God said, Don't you add your voice to those that says the Lord's not in this. Lord, I'll be faithful and I'll say it. Even if it takes my life, I'll say it. Matthew, go to Matthew 27. Did you know at the crucifixion there was an earthquake? Look at this, Matthew 27, 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, look at that. When the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. What did God say in Isaiah? When my judgments are in the earth, the whole world will learn righteousness. Who is this centurion? A Roman, a heathen, may have nailed him to the cross. A few minutes before, he had no fear. You're just a male factor. Ping, ping, ping. But you let that earthquake hit, and the Bible says, look at it. 54, when they saw, those, when they saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, oh my God, truly, he was the Son of God. And this is interesting. Turn over a page to chapter 28. When Jesus was resurrected, there was an earthquake. Boy, there's a whole lot of shaking going on, wasn't it, friend? <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 2. It says, verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. It says there was an earthquake there when he arose from the dead, and there was an earthquake when he was crucified on Calvary. Now, look at this. And I, want, I want to tell you to turn there because everybody knows the story well enough. You remember Paul and Silas was in jail? Remember? And they did what? They began to what? Sing praises to God. And while they were singing praises to God, the Bible says there came an earthquake, broke their chains, jailer was going to kill himself. Paul came out and said, do that self, no harm, we're all here. God sent an earthquake even then. And the jailer feared greatly. What did he do through that earthquake? The jailer learned righteousness. Paul could have preached to him all night long. Are you listening? Paul could have preached to him all night long. Paul could have said, Jailer, you need to get saved. Jailer probably even heard him preaching. But when the earthquake struck, Paul came out and he said, 
the Lord's going to be merciful to you. Don't do yourself no harm. He said, because you and your whole house is going to be saved. Wonder why the whole house is going to be saved? Because probably the earthquake shook them up too. Amen? I don't think that earthquake was just localized, just a, a seismic malfunction underneath the jail. I think it shook the whole area. And so Paul said, hey, earthquake, let's go to your house. They're, they're ready too. They're ready too. They're going to learn righteousness tonight too. So I tell you, there's a time for preaching and then there's a time for God to bring some wrath. People's face turns upward and God says, hey, behave yourself. Amen? Let me show you real quick and I'm going to close. I want to share something with you when I get through so don't anybody leave. I want to share a vision that, that the Lord's given my heart. Go to the book of Revelation. Now these are future earthquakes that the Lord is predicting. Prophetically, he tells about them before they ever happen. He already talks about them as though they've happened, but they hadn't happened yet. Revelation 6, verse 12, it says, Behold, 6, verse 12, I beheld, and he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became as black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. Stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Say this with me. Every mountain, every island were moved out of their places. Look this way, everybody. Look this way. That's why I said a while ago, you think you have a point of reference of things that's about to happen. You, you, the past is no point of reference at all. Turkey shook. Southern California shook. China shook. But there's coming in the near future. Hear me. There's coming in the near future judgments from God that the world doesn't even have a point of reference of anything that's ever happened before. Now, look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. I've got to hurry. My time is gone, gone, gone. Revelation 11, 13. Y'all give me a few more minutes. Yes. Bible said 11, 13, and in the same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain 7,000. Now, isn't that interesting? Look this way. Here the Bible predicts a tremor, doesn't give us the magnitude, but the Bible already says in advance, headlines in advance, that there's going to come an earthquake, and in that earthquake, 7,000 are going to die in that earthquake. It's headlines. Prophecy is headlines written in advance. And it even tells us how many will die. But now look this way, everybody. I'm fixing to take you to a scripture that's going to blow your mind. I've saved this one to last. I don't know how far we are away from these things taking place, but I can feel. I can sense and I can feel as a man of God, I can sense we're on the threshold I've seen some things take place that absolutely is going to turn the world on its ear. I mean the nations of the world on its ear where the inhabitants of the world are going to get a quick lesson in righteousness. There's a scripture here in Revelation. I've read this for many years and every time I read it, I just I shudder. The Bible talks about an earthquake. Go to Revelation 16. Look this way, please. Now, what I was going to say a while ago, and I forgot to say it, I'm not a prophet. I am a pastor. That's all I am. I'm not a prophet. I'm not prophesying. But I know what the Lord spoke to my heart. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He's been dealing with me for a long time. And believe me, I didn't want to come up here this morning and do this. I wanted to preach something really encouraging to you today. I missed the pulpit last Sunday. 
And I really wanted to preach something really encouraging to you today. But the Lord spoke to me and he said that this, the conscience of this nation is becoming more and more sensitive. And more and more now, they're beginning to wonder and they're beginning to lift their heads and they're beginning to look up toward me. And God said, you be faithful to preach my word. But he said, you tell them that the worst of the judgment has not come yet. That is yet to come. And in days to come, you're going to see the earth reel and shake and roll to and fro like a drunkard. And you are going to see storms, friend. Just this last week, we saw that storm coming. And I know it's time for hurricanes, but we saw a storm coming that it was so huge that to look at the state of Florida up against it, it terrified me when I saw it on the Weather Channel and I saw that big storm before it started taking that turn. It was up to 155 miles an hour. Huge! The eye of it was 50 miles circumference. And the state of Florida looked like a little old banana sticking down there. And here that thing came. If that hadn't have turned, and it did enough damage just in rain, but by the time it hit, it had dissipated greatly. But if it had not dissipated, and if that thing would have hit as big as it was, it would have been much more devastating than Andrew. God's trying to speak to America. Wake up. God does not want to send judgment. And he's trying to tell us to turn in mercy. Jesus. Look at this. Revelation 16. Verse 18. The Bible says in chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 16, 18, there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. The great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations, look at that word plural, nations, fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of the wrath. And every island, how many islands? Every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And it said there will even come a great hail out of heaven, every stone about a hundred pounds, the weight of a talent. But men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because the plague was exceeding great. It said that mountains departed, and the islands departed, and it said there was such a great earthquake. Look this way, everybody. Such a great earthquake has never been recorded since man was upon the earth. Now you think about that for a minute. Years ago, they had one in Alaska. Terrible earthquake. They've had them in China, Russia. Even before they was able to measure seismologically how, how powerful and how great the earthquake was. But I'm talking about devastating. But the Bible says that this earthquake will be so great, it will be one that will be incomparable since the days of man upon the earth. And it's, this headline's right there in your Bible before it ever happens. Now, I want to close today with good news. I want to tell you, we're still in a mode of mercy. Will you let me give you a couple more scriptures? These are mercy scriptures. Can I give you a couple more? And I want to tell you a vision that's on my heart. These are going to be hard to find. But I want you to find them. They're back over toward the last part of your Old Testament. And the first one, first one is Habakkuk. It's even hard to say. Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk is right before Zephaniah and right after Nahum. Does that help you? It's over there around Micah and Obadiah and Amos. It's over a couple of books right before Zechariah. I want everybody to turn to Habakkuk. Stay there with me now because I'm almost through. Y'all with me? Okay. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. O Lord, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. But Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. 
Would you say that with me? Lord in wrath, please remember mercy. Zephaniah, over to the right, next book over to the right, chapter 2, verse 2. Zephaniah 2, verse 2. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord. All ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Hallelujah. She la la ma ba 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 na 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 ma ma ba 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 ma ya ta ya. ya la la ba ba ya ta pa ka sha ta. Verse two. Let's read that again. Before the decree bring forth. Before the decree bring forth. Before the day passes the chaff. And before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness and seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. I've got another scripture, but I'm going to close. I want you to look this way, everybody. I need your prayers. I told my wife that I was going to do this this morning. I've never talked like this to the congregation. But I told Brenda that I was going to say this this morning, and I haven't talked to the board about this, about saying this, but they know what I'm doing. I travel. I have a separate ministry from Brown's one. It's called Partners in Revival. It used to be called Feast of Fire. But I changed the name of it. Ken Gott and I sat down one day and was having a meal together, and while we were talking, I kept saying revival, partners in revival. And the Lord changed my ministry from the name Feast of Fire to Partners in Revival. And if the issue is not to get money, but the issue is to partner with pastors and their spouses for a move of God in the last days. I started this separate nonprofit ministry with the blessings of my board and with the blessings of the church. Matter of fact, we just sent out our first newsletter this last week, and I notified some of you here in the church that I was going to send you a newsletter, but it was not a plea for money. Uh, I wanted some of our old friends here in the church that has been with us down through the many years, I wanted you to be able to keep up with our ministry that we're doing outside of Brownsville. But God has been dealing with me. And I'm about to take our ministry separate from Brownsville. I'm still pastor here, and I plan on being pastor here till the Lord comes. I don't plan on leaving. I plan on being here till the Lord comes. But that's right. But I did start a separate nonprofit ministry. I didn't want to pocket the money that came in. I wanted to put it in a nonprofit ministry. It's very expensive to do what we're doing. But one thing that the Lord has laid on my heart. I still travel every Monday and Tuesday. I'm leaving right after service this morning. I go off every Monday and Tuesday. I travel by coach. And I try to help spread revival, but I also minister to ministers and their spouses. But one thing that God has laid on my heart to do next year, and I've already taken steps to get everything underway, is the Lord has laid it on my heart to next year begin in major cities across America prayer crusades. And it won't be preaching, although I'm a preacher, but it will be prayer crusades. And here's what the Lord has said to me. He said to me two things. He said, America is ready to repent, and America is ready to pray. He said they're ready to repent, and they're ready to pray. And I'm going to go in, and I'm going to, I'm going to lease and rent coliseums, Across America, probably next year I'll, I'll do five or six, three or four, five or six, but I've already got two scheduled and lined up. The first one I'm going to is in Denver, Colorado. And we're going to make it cross-denominational. 
We're going to make it interdenominational. And it won't be preaching, but the Lord says that his people are ready to pray. We're going to have awesome praise and worship. We're going to have the sounding of the shofar. And we're going to bring in big, oversized prayer banners like we have here at Brownsville. We're going to have four of each banner made up that will be paraded through that audience, and there'll be spotlights on them. And as those things make their way to the front of those coliseums, there will be preachers of all denominations there to help lead in prayer. And the Lord has spoke to my heart, and he said, I will pour out my spirit mightily in these prayer crusades. And he said, what I want you to do, he said, when something happens like is happening right now in America, like Columbine, it's amazing how the Lord opened up the door for Denver for me to go there first because that was what was on my heart. Go to Denver, go to Denver, go to Denver. Well, we were in Denver for Wake America. We had a major outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. I hit the platform that night so hard, it almost knocked the breath out of me, and I, didn't even, I couldn't believe I was on the platform. The power of God exploded that hard. I knew God was doing something. I just heard Benny Hinn last week talk about being in Denver, and he was talking about what God did in Denver. Just heard him talking about it last week. The Holy Spirit worked it out for me to have Denver as the first place that we're going to for one of these prayer crusades. And the Lord said, I'm going to burst forth mightily, and I'm going to burst forth in denominations. And I will bring denominations that's not in revival. In those prayer sessions, revival will break out in these meetings. The second place I'm going to is Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we're going to have powerful, awesome praise and worship. We're going to have the prayer banners, and it's going to be prayer. Like I said, it's not going to be preaching. And the Lord has given me the assurance that he's going to break forth in a mighty way. One of the things that the Lord has spoken to my heart to do, he said, son, what's happening in America is he said, hell is raising some gates in cities. Like in Denver, hell come in out there, shot down those kids. The church backs up in horror. Oh my God. And hell raises up a gate. See? Hell lifts up the gate. And the church backs up in horror. The Lord said, I want you to go in, pull down those gates. God said, I want you to pull them down. He said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God shall raise up a standard against that gate. And he said, I want you to go in, mobilize the body of Christ, mobilize the churches, move in with the spirit of prayer that I gave you in Brownsville. Move in with that spirit of worship like breaks out in Brownsville. God said, do it in all denominations where they can hear it. And how the different pastors come, how different denominations come, they'll come by the thousands. And have them lift up their voices. And he said, I want you to take those gates that hell has lifted up. And I want my body to take those gates and pull them down so that I might move in in righteousness. The Lord also spoke to me and he said, I want you to do something else. He said, I want you to have some mobile, some mobile prayer task force ready to go at a moment's notice. And he said, when something breaks forth like a hurricane or like an earthquake or like shootings, he said, by that following weekend, you can already have your mobilized prayer task force on the way, and they can organize a citywide prayer meeting while the event is still going on and while the people's conscience is still sensitive. Whew, I feel that. Stand to your feet. Shoot. Holy Ghost, lift up your voices, friends. Jesus. Jesus. Holy Lord. The gates of hell shall not prevail. I said the gates of hell shall not prevail. 
against the church of the living God. God raised up Steve Hill and is using Steve Hill mightily to bring this nation to repentance. But the Lord said after they begin to repent, he said, I want you to mobilize my people to begin to pray. That's my role. God's raised up Steve to get people to repent, among others. God's raised up Steve. He's raised up me, among others. We're not saying by any means we're the only ones. That's, for God forbid, that's spiritual pride, and I don't believe that. But the Lord said, I've called him to get my people to repent. And he said, after they repent, he said, I want you to follow up and get them to pray, teach them to pray. My, my pastor, Brother Wetzel, I look back now and I see those prayer meetings. I see now the purpose of it. I remember the first prayer meeting I was in with him. It was dark, and I was a kid. I was 15 years old. And I remember asking myself that night as I heard those grown men praying, I said, Lord, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? I didn't know how to pray. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and he says, just, I have you here. Learn, learn. And now I can see and I can understand a lot. God is trying to get his people to pray. Let me just say this before I close. I remember so well when God gave me those banners. I remember I sat down with my staff and they looked at me like I was from Mars. They just looked at me. They, they couldn't see it. I went home. I told Brenda about it. And she said, supper's ready. <laughs> she, she couldn't see it. I remember an evangelist called me the next morning on Monday. And, and I, I remember I talked to him on the phone. And uh, I told him about it, and he just changed the subject. Nobody, I couldn't, no, no, but I knew in my heart. I knew it in my heart. I felt the plow go in, and I felt the seed drop, and I felt the earth come back over it. I knew it was something that God put in my heart. And I thank God that he's allowed us to live, to see the day that we're going to see some major prayer crusades across America. God is about to do something awesomely and wonderfully in this nation. And in conjunction with what God is about to do, and he's about to get this nation ready to pray, in conjunction with that, there's going to be some things break forth that's going to get the, the, the attention of not only this nation, but the nations of the world. Would you please pray for me? I'd like for you to pray for me. I, I, I really appreciate so much your prayers, because I know that hell hates it. It was two years ago last Friday that I fell. Two years ago last Friday, the devil tried his best to kill me. God's been merciful. I don't even have a pain. I don't have no residual problems from it at all. God's been merciful. He's been merciful. But I know, but I know that hell is going to fight me, and I know that he's going to fight this right here. And I'd like for you to pray for me. And uh, I'd like for you to ask God to give us favor and give us blessings. I'd like to go. What, what my desire is, I think the Marine wants to say something. <laughs> what my desire is, is I want to travel across America, uh, even if it's in conjunction, Bob, with Wake Americas. I want to travel across America, and I want to see, in these prayer meetings, I want to see God uninhibited. I want to see him unrestrained. I want to see him just break forth awesomely and powerfully. Hallelujah. I'd like to ask the board of directors and all the deacons to come up on the platform for pray too. So, Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. All the pastors also come on up. Church, I want you to really pray this morning. Will you do that? Don't don't just don't just talk. No, I mean get a hold of God for me. Brenda, this you is come so on important. Up too. This is so important. Brother John. Jesus. I want to ask Brother oh, John Davison to anoint him. And I believe this is of God. So Holy Lord. folks, just put your hands this way as he anoints the pastor. And Jesus. Pray for him. Let's believe John for a miracle. Jesus, Spirit of God. We ask your anointing. God, we ask your anointing. God, we ask 
your leadership. We ask you, O oh God, Father, we ask you, Lord, to direct the storm. Father, we ask you, Jesus, it's you, Lord. God, we're with you, Jesus. We want your will, Father. Glory to your name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Spirit of God, move from front of your back of God. Oh, Spirit of God. Holy Jesus. Touch us, Lord. Holy Jesus. Touch us, Lord. Holy Jesus. Touch us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. God, we want you, Lord. Oh, Spirit of God. Hallelujah. We need your help. Glory to God. Father, we need you and your strength and your power, your glory, God, upon him, Jesus. God, we ask you to build a hedge around him. Keep him and protect him, Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus. Right now, Lord. God, we lift you up. Oh, Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Somebody's oh, word Jesus. Word Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody's got a word of prophecy. Somebody's got a word of prophecy. Somebody obey God. For I have chosen this place, saith God, and I have revived and refreshed the nations of the world. But the revival that started here must spread, saith the Lord. One place cannot do it. I have chosen this place. But I have chosen these people to surround this man of God and this team. And what has happened here for the past five years shall now spread. For America shall hear. America shall experience. There is a God in heaven. There is a revival that shall cover this nation and the nations of the world. For it shall come to pass. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Not just in Pensacola, but revival centers shall spring up all over the nation. What I've done here is just the beginning. It will intensify. It will increase. It will spread. And the wrath of God will come. But people shall cry out and I will send mercy. And I will send my glory. I will send my grace. And then the trumpet shall sound. I will come in the clouds of glory and I will gather my people to me. This is the beginning, but it shall spread. Rejoice in the judgment and rejoice in the mercy and rejoice in the glory. For this is the day of my visitation, saith God. Bless the Lord Jesus. I want you to remain standing for a moment. Folks, I want you to listen to me. For four, five years, I've walked behind John Kilpatrick and have reaped the blessing of revival. I've been places seven months, eight months, Holy Ghost revival. And it's all because I've just walked behind this man of God. The Holy Spirit told me to do that, told me to carry his attache case, told me just to be a servant to him. I've seen him stand. I'm not bragging on him, but I need to tell you what I've seen. I've seen out there in meetings. I've seen him stand and just break in the presence of God and talk about the sounds of revival and talk about prayer. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't minimize preaching, but America doesn't need another sermon. I mean, we've got preaching all the time. I don't minimize it, but what America needs is to act on what we've heard. We need to react and respond to what we've heard. But I've seen God raise up this man and, of course, Steve Hill and Lindell Cooley and the team. And all I've done is just walk behind them as a servant. But the Holy Spirit gave me a vision when I came here that what's been happening here for five years would spread all over the nation. And there would be revival centers like Brownsville. And people wouldn't have to drive many, many miles. They wouldn't have to fly. They could go down the street and find a church in the white-out heat of Holy Ghost revival 24 hours a day. And when Pastor shared this vision with me about the prayer revival... I thought that's the greatest thing that, I, that I've ever heard. It's a God idea. It's not a good idea. It's a God idea. This is a vision of the Lord. And here's what I want us to do in a few moments. In a few moments, I'm going to give an altar call. If there's sin in your life, if there's junk in your life, we're going to deal with it. But then we're going to join hands and just agree that God's going to raise up that army of prayer warriors. But once you look at me and listen to me, Jesus prayed more than he did anything else. 
and Jesus. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to perform miracles, teach us to preach. They saw the thing that he emphasized the most with his life was prayer. He performed some 39 miracles. He taught some 19 parables, and he preached nine sermons. But they saw the thing that really moved them was what moved God was his prayer. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's the need of America, the American church. Somebody said, I'm trying to get prayer back in the school. I'm trying to get back in the church, folks. When it comes back in the church, when it comes back in the church, then it will go back in the school. In a few moments, we're going to join hands and we're going to pray that this revival spreads. I believe this is a God idea. I saw a man look at John Kilpatrick and he said, Pastor, if you'll let me, I'll put your ministry together and I'll guarantee you a million dollars a month coming in. John Kilpatrick said, I don't want a million a month. I don't want the money. And he walked away from that. I've seen him do that kind of thing. And there's times I think, you know, he's so unusual because to do what needs to be done is going to take lots of finances. But he's not going after money. He's going after God. And because of that, revival is going to spread. It's not about money. It's about the presence of God. The pastor asked me to give an altar call. I'm going to do it right now. Seven months we spent in Fort Worth, Texas. And they asked us to teach at the school about giving an altar call because we saw thousands of people respond. So I called Steve Hill. I said, Steve, I've learned under your ministry. I want you to share with me. And the first thing he told me, he said, John, Never assume, never assume that everybody's right with God. He said on a Sunday setting, people can be clapping and shouting and yet have sin in their life. Never assume that, that Brother Joe, and I think he mentioned that name, is right with God because he shouted last week. Because he said, Brother Joe may have fallen to pornography last night and he's in a trap and he needs to be set free. We've heard a powerful word this morning. You can go a lot of places and not hear as much scripture as we've heard today. Pastor said one thing, the judgment of God is really the mercy of God because it's bringing us to repentance. And there's one message, and Steve has preached it time and again, and that's get the sin out. And I'm going to give an altar call right now, and I don't care if you're a Christian, backslider, if you've never known the Lord, regardless who you are, there's one message, get the sin out. A man had a vision that he stood before God, and as he stood before God, the accuser of the brethren was there. And the devil began to remind him of all the sins that he had committed. And the angel looked at the man and said, how do you plead? The man said, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. I've said this time and again. The blood will never cover what you don't uncover. There's therapy. There's healing. There's a remedy for your malady. And there is deliverance. But you must deal with the sin right now. If you're here and you've never known the Lord, it would be the utter foolishness for us just to release you and let you walk out without giving you a chance to make your peace with God. If you're here and you're a backslider, that means if there's a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are right now, you've backslid that much. If you're here and while he's been preaching, God's been convicting you of a sin in your life, you need to deal with it right now. I'm going to count to three and all over this building, in the balcony, and over in the other sanctuary. If you'll say, John Davis, while you're talking, the Holy Ghost is dealing with me. There's sin in my life, and I want God to take it out. Now listen again. The blood will never cover what you don't uncover. If you don't admit it, God cannot remit it. It's all about being honest. And the message today is get the sin out. I don't care who you are, sinner, backslider, or maybe you're a Christian, but you've got some junk in your life. You'll say, John Davis, I want God to take it out right now. When I hit that number three, I want you to raise your hand all over the building. Don't close your eyes. Don't bow your head. I want you to say, I want the sin out today in the name of Jesus. One, two, three. Raise it higher right now. I've got sin in my life. In the balcony, the main floor, in the main sanctuary, over in the other building. Raise your hand high. Lift it high. Let God see it. Let the devil see that I'm not going to live with it any longer. I want the junk to come out today in the name of Jesus. And there are hands all over the building, in the balcony. And over across the street, I believe there are hands in there. I want every one of you that have your hands up right now to raise your other one up right now. Just raise both hands in the air. It's a type of surrender. And many, many people with their hands in there. Now the rest of you, would you do the same? I want to lead you in a prayer. You're not talking to Pastor John Kilpatrick. You're talking to Father God. I want you to pray the prayer that America's been praying for five years. God's used one man, Steve Hill, to restore the message of holiness and repentance to the church. But one man can't do it. God's got to raise up hundreds and thousands of people. That's why we've got to move into the mode of prayer. With both hands in the air, say these words out loud. Dear God, I love you with all of my heart. I thank you 
for the word today. I believe the word. I receive the word. I obey your word. According to your word, as I pray this prayer, you will hear, you will answer. Right now, in the name of Jesus, search my heart, try my thoughts, probe my conscience, take out all the junk. As humble as I know how, I repent. I ask you, Father, to forgive me for the bad I've done, the good I haven't done. Set me free. Cleanse my heart. I'm your child. I believe your word. And right now, according to your word, you cannot lie. All of my sins are under the blood, behind your back, in the sea, forgiven, forgotten, forever. I am clean. I'm right with God. I am ready. I'm ready for heaven. Ready to live. Ready to die. Ready for revival. I am ready. Satan, hear me good. Get out of my head. Out of my heart. Out of my home. In the name of Jesus, I am free. And I shout it. And I shout it. I shout it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Come on, give him praise. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And join hands with the one next to you before Linda comes for communion. I want us to do this today. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Because there's no sin, there's a righteous fervent forceful prayer going to go up. I just want you to pray that right now God will begin to surround John Kilpatrick with the partners. I told you I saw him turn down a millionaire, a millionaire who could have dropped a lot of money in his lap, and he said, I don't want it. I don't want, I'm not going to put together a mailing list to try to get money. And he walked away. I want you to pray right now that God will surround this man of God with men and women that realize the greatest power is the power of prayer, and the revival is going to spread. Come on, would you just lift your voice right now? <laughs> Satan, you're a liar and you're a loser. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the powers of hell that are trying to hinder, that are trying to stop the onward progress of this mighty army of prayer warriors. Father, raise up the army, surround John Kilpatrick with the men and the women. And Father, even this building right now, the building across the street, you're raising up people that's gonna stand with him as one man with one voice, we're gonna march across America. We're gonna march across the nations of the world. And this revival that's been going in Pensacola for five years will spread and intensify and lives will be challenged and changed and charged. In the name of Jesus, Father, we give you the glory. Father, you know the financial needs of pastor. I'm praying in Jesus' name for a financial miracle. I'm believing you for a miracle of debt cancellation. I'm believing you, God, to raise up people of means and people that are faithful, even the widows that will give. Father, you're going to raise them up. We're going to sow seed in the most fertile soil in the world, the soil of Holy Ghost revival. Devil, you've tried to contain the revival. You've tried to confine it to Brownsville, but it's going to spread all over the assemblies of God, the Baptist, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, and the Lutheran, and the Catholic, interdenominational. All nations shall experience the sights and sounds of the Holy Ghost. Father, we believe you, and in Jesus' name, we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We lift our hands as one man with one voice, and we shout this shout of faith. Come on, praise him. Come on, praise him. Come on, praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him the glory. Hallelujah. Jesus. I 
want you to shout the shout of faith. Walls are coming down. Lift your voice and just shout the shout of faith. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Bring America to her knees, God. Bring denominations to their knees in the name of the mighty Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. As quickly as you can, just you can be seated, but I want you just to find your way. I want the ushers, the deacons, uh, whoever does that, to start to distribute the elements of communion. Matter of fact, while they're doing that, let's keep a spirit of worship. Lift up your voice. Stand with me, choir. I want you to prepare your heart for the table of the Lord before we leave tonight. There's something exciting we're going to do at the end of the service. Pastor has had to get on the bus. He's got to go. But we're going to bless the Lord for what he's done in this place. Now, I know it's hard to stay seated and, and praise the Lord a lot, but I promise you, just hang on and let the choir say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lift up your voice and sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless your holy name with all my days. Oh, blessed be. Do it again. Come on, church, sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I bless your holy name for all. Blessed be the name. I am standing. Beneath your wings, and I am resting in your breath. Your great faithfulness, sing. Your great faithfulness is my reward, and it makes me want to say, and it makes me want to say, Yes, it be. my favorite things we do on Sunday morning and sometimes I know we do it at the end of service and it feels like we're rushing through I'm not going to preach to you I just want to explain something to you if you're broken this morning if you've got trouble in your life if you've got unforgiveness in your heart the table of the Lord is where you bring those things many many years in the church I was scared to death of the table of the Lord communion because my daddy used to say, now, if you eat or drink the body of God and you're undeserving and there's sin in your life, God will kill you. And it's true, but it also means that we come there broken. Because where else do we go as believers but to the table of the Lord to remember the broken body of the Lord. To remember the blood of Jesus. To remember. And he says, every time you do this, remember. I want you to just remember right now that you're sitting in this place in the middle of revival. And today we're going to come not sorrowfully, 
but to remember with joy the brokenness of the Lord. If you've got broken relationships in your life, the body of Jesus was broken for those. We're going to pray for one of our brothers in the church right now that has got an illness in his body. The broken body of our Lord, by his stripes, we are healed. By his blood, we are cleansed. We have repented today. How many repented? Got everything cleaned out. So now we've got a reason to come to the table of the Lord and rejoice. Celebrate the death, the burial, and most of all, the resurrection. If Jesus had only suffered pain and death and stayed in the ground, it wouldn't have been complete. But the Bible says that he took death, hell, and the grave, and he rose victoriously on the third day. And because he lives, I'm free. Because he was broken, I can walk uprightly. I don't have to walk with my head down anymore because Jesus died. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we remember your son. Jesus, we remember your death. Jesus, we remember your body. We remember the brokenness of your body. We remember, Lord, how you were led before your accusers as a lamb to the slaughter. When at any moment, Jesus, you could have called thousands of angels who would have destroyed the earth with one word. But you suffered all the humiliation, Lord. They pulled your beard out. They broke your body. They beat you unmercifully. And you allowed them to do it because of us. Thank you. We remember, Lord, we remember your blood. We remember your body broken for us. How can we forget your great sacrifice? Oh, we humbly remember. Come, let us Bow down, let us rejoice in God our Savior. Who laid down his life? Who laid down his life and paid the Price to gain God's faith. Oh. I think everyone's been served. I need you to serve me, brothers. I don't think you did. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Elmer Melton, would you come up here, brother? Wherever you are. Brother Elmer is one of the mainstays of our church. I love his heart for the Lord. And I've noticed something about Brother Elmer. He's a praying man. I love to hear Brother Elmer pray. This week he's going into the hospital. I don't know everything, Brother Elmer, but I heard back in the room uh, that, and, and Sister Brenda told me you're having angioplasty this week, possibly with some heart problems. But we believe that's not the end of the story. We believe the Lord is a healer. And we believe that God has put Brother Elmer in this church. And God's not finished yet. And we believe God is the healer. By his stripes we were healed. Upon himself took our afflictions. And I'm just going to trade bread with you, Brother Elmer. And I'm going to believe as we take the body of the Lord, the broken this representation of the body of the Lord, I believe that God's going to touch you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We remember. We remember your body. And Lord, we ask you right now as we take this bread, 
that you would bring healing to our brother. God, that you would heal his body. Every passage that's clogged, every heart murmur, any problems, Lord, just cause them to open up and be healed in Jesus' name. The body of the Lord remembered. Take the bread right now. We remember Jesus. We remember the Lord. As this bread breaks in our mouth, we remember your body that was broken. As we lift this cup, Lord, reverently to you. We remember the blood that washes us clean. The blood that poured down the cross that day. The spotless lamb slain. We remember. I want you to tell him right now, church, as you take the cup. I remember Jesus. Take the cup. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Stand to your feet right now. Thank him. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My soul doth magnify the Lord. <laughs> Come on, church, lift your voice. My soul, thank you, Lord. This morning, huh? I want to encourage you as we're about to close the service. We've got one more thing we want to handle, but I want to encourage you, families, fathers, mothers, children, observe the table of the Lord in your home. Don't wait till you get to church on Sunday to remember it. It's not a once a week thing or a once a year thing. It's all right to do it every day. Remember the Lord. Remember his blood. I tell you what it will do. It will keep you from sin. When you think about the cross of Calvary and Jesus hanging there, dying for you, temptation gets a lot less when you realize. Martin Luther, who was the great reformer of the church, says, men everywhere ought always to keep the cross before them. In time of temptation, in time of rejoicing, in time of sorrow, always remembering the death of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Miss Brenda, here comes the First Lady of Brownsville. She's got something to do. I won't keep you just a quick minute. I need you to stay just a little bit longer. We have a special guest here today, and he's come all the way from, jo from Johannesburg, South Africa. And Owen McGregor, will you come? He's a pastor there. We, along with 52 people, went to uh, Johannesburg in March. And uh, this is uh, the McGregor brothers, other brother that lives in South Africa. So now you know who he is. And we sure do love them, don't we? Well, uh, as you know, uh, Awake Deborah 
was started here at Brownsville. And the Lord, I was studying in Judges one day, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said he wanted uh, Deborah and Barak must be one and work together. And from that, I won't go into that because of time, but uh, the, the wake Deborah came out of that for ladies, and we want to help ladies to and teach them. And, and there's just a lot of things there that we're wanting to do with the ladies that the Lord's laying on our heart to help women. But, you know, every year at the conference, I ask the ladies to bring their very best offering to the Lord. I said, whatever you've got to do, bake cakes, you know, garage sales, whatever, I want your best offering. And you know what? I found out that women carry the checkbook. <laughs> I mean to tell you, our very first conference, we were raised $53,000. and wonderful? The second time it was 73. Hallelujah. But what I, what I did with the money is we give to the poor or somewhere where there is a need. Uh, the Lord lays it on my heart where to give the money to. And so we've been giving this money away. And we just came from Fargo, North Dakota, and we raised $45,000 there. God be the glory. And the, one of the conferences before that, we had raised uh, in the 73000 I had promised this dear brother we would buy him a tent because he feeds the poor children. Uh, close to Johannesburg and uh, their tent had holes in it. If it rained, they would all get wet and every day they go out and they feed these children. And so I said, we'll give you some money and we got a really nice tent. And uh, we sent him the tent and then we went over for the tour and uh, we got to dedicate that tent to the Lord. That was the first time I ever dedicated anything like that, but it was awesome. And to see it and to visit the children and see the work there, it's so wonderful what he's doing. Not only that, but Brother Pastor uh, McGregor uh, feeds people that comes to his church. He, does, he, he has a church in a tent. He doesn't even have a church. He's in a tent himself right in the middle of the city of Johannesburg. And he feeds the people on Sundays as they come to church and on Wednesdays just to get them there. And they, they wouldn't have it if he didn't feed them. He's doing a wonderful work. And he's truly, truly a man of God. I've heard him preach. He's a powerful preacher too. But uh, we just have another check for you to help in your work. And the ladies gave you this year, we're giving you a $20,000 check, Pastor. <laughs> we're on your time, so we'll hurry. I know you're hungry, but... Uh, Pastor, I want you to hear his heart and just speak to him just a few minutes and say hello and whatever is on your heart. Praise God. I am overwhelmed by your gift this morning. God bless you. I'd like to thank you and Pastor and the ladies and everyone that's been involved for, for this offering and also for coming in March. I'd like to tell you that uh, during the March conference we had with uh, Brenda, at, in Johannesburg, we focused on intercessory prayer and spiritual warfare, and God moved mightily. The last Sunday, we had such a breakthrough in the church. During the preaching part, when it was done, the ladies that came with, and Brenda was also involved in that, came forward and said they want to, on behalf of the Europeans, they want to... Uh, to repent towards the black people for slavery and, and all that. And you know, the whole church were in tears by that time. And the amazing thing is this, uh, as everyone was repenting, our dear sister here asked for a bucket of water and she went on her knees and washed one of the old black ladies' feet in the church. That brought such a repenting spirit in the church. And one of our black ladies in the church said now, she wants to wash Brenda's feet. And it was, it was just beautiful. 
We thank God for that. Also, the tent that you bought for the church in our town spirit. Uh, God is moving mightily. Souls are getting saved. The tent is packed. And we are doing the work of the Lord. Pastor Patrick was speaking here on prayer. And I want to say this, that Johannesburg is a very hard city. We might get uh, a church full of people Sunday morning, Sunday evening, weeknights. No one comes out because of the violence, because of what's going on. But since the time that you've come to pray there, we've seen that revivals are being attended better. People are coming more, getting more saved. Things are changing in the whole city. So we want to thank God for what He's doing. Amen. Also, with your coming there, you planted a seed in my heart. With, with you as Americans coming to Africa and, and come and bless us. Uh, I asked the Lord, that time I asked the Lord, because of, the, because of your coming, the Lord must give me the nations. I began to pray for nations. Because I realized they came to sow seeds and we also need to sow seeds. Amen. And I want to say that we are praying for you here in the United States. Every Sunday morning, we pray for one country in the world because of the seed you've planted there. And some time ago, the Lord told me he's releasing an anointing in the church so that we can feed nations also. So we thank God for that. Amen. And what the Lord told me, and most probably what Pastor Kilpatrick was speaking at the end of this message, his vision to go and pray in the different, country, uh, different areas. The Lord told me, and I'm speaking from my reference as South African, that the church is to dry. And what, I'm, what I understood by this is there's not enough weeping, there's not enough mourning, crying in the church. I'm not be speaking of people coming to the altars, but I'm speaking of people that's praying, crying before the Lord, and it's not happening. And God wants to bring this back to the church. Amen. God bless you. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Would you like to pray for Johannesburg and his work? Let's pray for him. I'm going to ask John Davis this, and he'll lead us in prayer. I want you to stretch your hands this direction. Just believe God for a mighty Holy Ghost revival to sweep that nation. Father, Makasatababakataya. Jesus, in the mighty name of the mighty Jesus, mm, we remove the obstructions, we shatter the shackles, and right now we just release that river anointing in a new dimension upon my brother, Father, as he leaves this place, may revival break out in Africa like never before, Father, we give you the glory, Woo, Jesus, hallelujah, yeah Lord, pour it on him, pour it on him for your glory, in the name of Jesus, fresh anointing, brother, fresh anointing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. I want to share one more thing. I'm going to ask you really to really be praying for Pastor and this, this prayer vision. Now look at me. You're going to be leaving in just a few moments. But folks, listen. If God's ever raised up a man to lead America in prayer, to lead the churches in prayer, I'm on the bus with him. Jack Hayford's calling him. I'm on the bus. People like Richard Roberts and other people are calling. He's very humbled. I'm proud of him, but he's very humbled. But God has chosen your pastor and our pastor to lead this nation in prayer. And I want to ask you to pray because we need financial miracles. I've watched him turn away from offerings. The man that's going to give a million dollars, he said, John, no, I'm not going after money. I'm just going after hearts. We need God to raise up people all over this nation that will say, we'll partner with you in revival. And we've been doing that now for, for three years, supporting his ministry. And I want you to believe God to mightily, mightily anoint him and surround him with people. Raise your hands right now and believe it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, just surround him with the right partners and may this revival spread. And we'll give you the glory. Give God the praise. Give God the praise. <laughs> 